Good evening. I'm going to start tonight's show working through the Ministry of Defence's battle update. We'll start in the Kupiansk direction in the north and then work our way down to the southern area of the Son and the Black Sea, covering off the fighting today. And then I'll do a little bit of an update on some reporting on just some of the support that has been provided by the West to Ukraine in August. Okay. Starting in Kupiansk, now these are using the Russian Ministry of Defence daily reports. As I've said before, um, all concerns about these being Russian and biased, I freely admit. However, at least we do get consistent daily reporting from the Russian Ministry of Defence. We don't get a similar source of reporting from the Ukrainian sources. Uh, also, um, much of the reporting that we do see from the Ministry of Defence later is backed up and corroborated by video evidence. Examples in the past being um, when the Mus Russian Ministry of Defence has reported things like M777 howitzers being destroyed in a region, we then see video evidence um, confirming that later. So for that reason, and for lack of any other better sources, I'll continue to use these in these daily updates. Now, in the Kupiansk direction, I might just uh, show a sh brief film here. Uh, there is reported use here that the Zapad group of forces have repelled attacks by assault detachments of the 43rd, 44th, 115th mechanised and 68th Jaeger brigades of the Ukrainian armed forces in the areas of Sinkovka. Sinkovka is up in Kharkov region, up near just near Kupiansk, which is a pivotal point which seems to be in the grey zone and and at once it does fall, will allow the Russians to really then begin to advance upon Kupiansk. Anyhow, reporting is that heavy flamethrowers have been used in this area. Now, the heavy flamethrowers, as we know, are the TOS-1 thermobaric systems. I've spoken about them before. I'm just going to show a little video here. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any sound accompanying it. Um, but we'll just have a look at, at this... Now, if you can see that, if you're just listening, um, what is uh, distinctive about the explosions we're seeing here is that each one of them forms a like a spherical ball of um, energy or shockwave which emanates out from these TOS thermobaric systems. Now, I'll just read a little bit about these. In an analysis of the usage of Solten Specs, I'm not quite sure of the Russian pronunciation of that, but what it means, or what, it's, what it roughly translates to, is blazing sun. Um, in analysis of the usage of these uh, Solnit Sepix. In the Second Chechen War and Special Military Operation, the CIA wrote... Everything alive is consumed by the flames. Victims outside the flames sustain injuries with all internal organs ruptured. As I mentioned yesterday, they, the, um, the vacuum concussive force produced by these, the explosions from these weapons um, impacts areas of the body where um, density of material changes. So as you go from flesh to bone or as you go from muscle to organs. It goes on, they go on to say, a full salvo from the flamethrower system, and these are launched from device, I think, 12 or 24, perhaps, if a full, um, a full contingent of these look from one launcher are used. A full salvo from the flamethrower system can incinerate eight city blocks, creating hell for all within the target zone. A dispersed mixture fills any space. So this is where a, a, a fuel vapor is um, is uh, dispersed or initially. This dispersed mixture fills any space. Subsequently, the detonator is triggered, igniting the aerosol and burning everything in its vicinity. The sole drawback of the TOS, Solnitsebek and Tososhka is their limited range, spanning from 6 to 10 kilometres. However, if they do reach the line of fire, as reported by Ukrainian media, those who are not directly impacted but witness the aftermath of Solnitsk often experience psychological breakdowns. 
So these weapons do appear to be a particularly frightening weapon to be near. Um, reports that people within, uh, depending on the, on, the, on the size of them, that people within um, maybe up to a kilometre will suffer um, damage to, to lungs and to ears and um, eardrums and that sort of thing. So the Ministry um, of Defence reporting then goes on to say that the enemy's losses in Kapiansk direction today amounted to 120 Ukrainian servicemen killed and wounded, one tank, three armoured fighting vehicles, three vehicles, as well as a US-made M777 artillery system. Moving south then from um, Kupiansk to Krasny Liman, this is where the centre group of forces are operating. They have also been conducting airstrikes using, um, using air capability and artillery. They have repelled three attacks by assault groups of the 42nd Mechanised Brigade. Um, this has been in Chervonaya Dibrova. During the day in the Krasny Laman direction, reported losses or estimated losses amount to more than 80 Ukrainian troops, two armoured fighting vehicles, two pickup trucks and two Vodzika self-propelled artillery units. Now, while we do get, um, often do get video confirmation of some of the items mentioned by the Ministry of Defence in terms of armoured fighting vehicles and trucks and tanks and artillery systems, the estimates given for the number of Ukrainian soldiers lost um, by the Ministry of Defence ha is reportedly due to Russian ability to intercept Ukrainian communications at some point through their chain of reporting um, back to their command centres. Moving down to the Donetsk region. Two enemy attacks were repelled close to Pervomoyevsky and uh, Nevelskoy in the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, this, these were repelled by the Yug group of forces, uh, again operating with artillery, aviation and heavy flamethrowers. In the Bakhmut or Artyomysk direction, the fighting near Klesheyevka does not stop. Now this is reporting that was provided on a telegram channel today. The Russian army again counterattacked the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine. Although the militants use infantry with the support of armoured vehicles and artillery, they still fail to repel our attacks. On the Donetsk sector of the front, our soldiers continue to storm the enemy positions in Marienka. Also, Russian fighters are developing an offensive on the Orekhovo Vasilyevka region of the Donetsk People Republic. And this is a small settlement area just to the northwest of Bakhmut. The Ministry of Defence then reports the enemy's losses in Donetsk direction amounted up to 240 Ukrainian servicemen killed and wounded, three armoured fighting vehicles, five pickup trucks a Grad MLRS combat vehicle, a US-made M777 artillery system, and two D-30 howitzers. Again, to say today we see multiple reports of artillery pieces being picked off in this conflict. In the South Donetsk direction, units of the Vostok group of forces, again using airstrikes, artillery fire and heavy flamethrowers, inflicted fire damage on clusters of Ukrainian manpower and hardware in the areas of Novodenovsky and Priyutne. The enemy's losses amounted to up to 130 Ukrainian servicemen, two armoured fighting vehicles, three motor vehicles, as well as D-20, M-Star B and D-30 howitzers. Now, the Zaporozhye region. In Zaporo Zaporozhye, this is where the Ukrainian forces are focusing their fighting in what appears to be the last big push and attempt to make some ground and gain some success in this um, failed offensive. In the Zaporozhye direction, uh, using the results of airstrikes and artillery fire, Russian forces successfully repelled five attacks by assault groups of the 116th Mechanized, the 82nd Airborne Assault and 46th Air Mobile Brigades of the um, Armed Forces of Ukraine on Robotne in the Zaporozhye region. Heavy, bloody battles reported on the southern outskirts of Robotne 
with Ukrainian forces pushing toward Novopropkopovka and uh, Vobovia. Now, let me just get the map up here. So just having a look around this area now. I'll make this a little larger if I can. This is Robotne. I've updated this blue line here. Now, this blue line is indicating the rough location of the Ukrainian forces in the last day or so, uh, this push down, this wedge forming down to the southeast of Robotne seems to have grown. Now, a military summary channel has just been reporting, as I was going to air with this, that the um, Ukrainians seem to have looked to um, perhaps plan to skirt Novoprokopivka and may instead be looking to drive down through this wedge and then come in underneath and um, circle across and then cut off any Russian area between Robotne and Novopropovka. Um, interestingly, he is reporting that while previously the Boba group, this is B-O-B-R, Boba, you, if you've watched any of the Twitter or Telegram channels that show the video reporting of um, f the FPV drone strikes, Boba are um, often on a daily basis releasing videos of their um, drone activities. Summary, military Summary Channel has been reporting that over the past few weeks, all of their activity has been confined to this area here. Let's sort of around this area in here is where they have been concentrating their drone strikes. Um, however, in the last 24 hours, they have been starting to report drone strikes in Robotny itself. Now, he provided two possible um, reasons for this. One being that due to the, the wedge driving down here, um, there was a need to support the artillery strikes in Robotny or perhaps more likely that due to this wedge now approaching Novopropovka, that the Boba drone team have been forced to pull back and have perhaps been um, forced back down south somewhere here um, and may now not be within range of reaching up to where they were operating before. Um, this, this tactic of the Ukrainians to drive this wedge down to Novopropokivka is a high-risk strategy. If they do drive down here, if they are able to extend this and, for example, bring this wedge down, down to here, like this, and then perhaps bring across here to this roadway, that is suggestive of what they may be trying to achieve here. Um, but it becomes very risky because the, um, the Russians then from Novopokrovka over here and on the, on the eastern side and from Kopani here on the west uh, would be able to then start a drive across here And from here to the, from the east, coming across and end up cutting off and encircling the Ukrainians that have formed this wedge down here. So it's a very risky strategy. Um, it's one that we will watch and no doubt within the next few days we'll see if the Ukrainian approach has been successful, if they are able to reach this road, cut off this area and then look to strengthen and widen out this wedge including all of Robotne and reaching up to Kopani and taking all of this area. We'll wait and see what happens there. Um, speaking of the drone activity, the, the Boba um, drone squad. Reporting has also come out today. This is by, uh, was coming from the Slavinia, Slavinian Grad uh, media uh, telegram channel. 
that 600 visually confirmed strikes of Landsat drones, Russian Landsat drones, have now been compiled. And there's been some data taken out of that. Uh, of the 600 confirmed strikes, 196 of them destroyed the target they are intended to hit. 320 of them damaged the target. 44 of the strikes uh, resulted in an undetermined or unconclusive um, end to the drone's mission, due in, in most times due to um, video failure prior to the strike occurring and no other drones in the area monitoring to be able to confirm how that um, drone had ended its mission. And 39 misses. These misses are likely to be either direct misses where flying at speed they've missed their intended target or fuse failures. Um, you will, if you have seen any of this footage from these FPV drones as they're making their strikes, um, that they some of them do um, some of them do hit and fail to detonate um, when they do strike their vehicle. Of the 600 confirmed strikes, their targets. A brief breakdown of the targets: 151 towed guns or towed pieces of artillery and 133 self-propelled guns. So these are the the, the crabs, um, the, the self-propelled howitzers, um, the M777s, these type of things, and other, and other uh, Soviet-era uh, artillery pieces. Also, of that total, 18 multiple launch rocket systems. So we can see that nearly 280 of the 600, so nearly a third, of them have been targeted at artillery systems. And um, this is one of the reasons that it has made this war so different to any other, where the use of very cost-effective, very cheap drones compared to the expensive pieces of armoured equipment and artillery, these drones have been able to take out some significant numbers and really make um, the use of drones an asymmetric game-changer in this conflict. Um, in other particularly devastating news for the Ukrainian Air Force in the, this area of Zaporizhia, Air Defence was able to shoot down two Su-25 aircraft um, close to Malaya Tokmacha and Novodanilovka in the Zaporizhia region. Uh, nine HIMARS projectiles were intercepted during the day. And a Russian, uh, Russian fighter has shot down a Ukrainian Mi-8 helicopter in the Zaporozhye region. So the, the Zaporozhye region, the Zaporozhye region here, which we were looking at earlier, uh, really is where the bulk of the fighting is happening at the moment. Uh, even in even in areas around here like um, Yurozhne and um, Staromayorsk in the Varemki Ledge here, it seems as though the Ukrainians have uh, reduced their attacks or paused to some extent in this area. Um, around Donetsk, we've had reports of um, heavy fighting still, but now the Russians making progress westward. And of course, up in the, up in the northern areas, up here along this Kupiansk uh, Liman line, we've had for the last month almost constant daily reports of small Russian advances to the west. Um, but the Ukrainians seeming to be focusing all of their activity on this area here in Zaporozhye, um, working to get towards Tokmak, if at all possible. Now... In the, the Russian Ministry of Defence then goes on to report that the total for the uh, for the last 24 hours in the Zaporozhye direction, up to 200 Ukrainian servicemen killed and wounded, three armoured fighting vehicles, four motor vehicles, two US M777 artillery systems, a German-made Panzerhabitzer 2000 and Polish-made Crab self-propelled artillery systems, a D-20 howitzer and a US-made M119 gun. So just in Zaporozhye today, the reporting is one, two, three, four, five, six, um, six Western-supplied um, pieces of artillery 
destroyed today. Now, in the Hassan region, um, in the Hassan region down here, um, again, activity in this area has been in a little bit of a um, a lull, it seems, over the last week or so. There hasn't been the gr great activity we saw a few weeks ago when the the Ukrainians made a push into Kazachi Lahiri in this area here. Um, what we have had is reports that the Russians are continuing, though, along this area here near the Antonovsky Bridge, around these areas here, um, to continue to bomb uh, locations in here of the uh, of the Ukrainian forces. In the Kherson region, uh, Russian units uh, eliminated up to 15 Ukrainian servicemen, five motor vehicles, a US-made M777 artillery system, a D-30 howitzer. Um, in addition, a, a P-37 radar station used for detecting air targets, guiding fighter aircraft and targeting anti-aircraft missile systems was destroyed near the city of Zaporozhye. And an ammunition depot of the 47th Mechanized Brigade. Um, the 47th Mechanized Brigade were the brigade who started the offensive in the Orekhov uh, Robotny area in what's now known as Bradley Square. Um, and they were the brigade that uh, suffered the heavy losses initially in the minefields, like losing a number of leopards on their first day on the front line. Ammunition depot of the 47th Mechanized Brigade has been destroyed near Slavgorod in the Dnepropetrovsk region. Um, additional reporting says that last night the armed forces of the Russian Federation launched a strike with long-range airborne high-precision weapons against an airfield near Pinchuki in Kiev region. Um, it's not reported what the target was, but the reporting is that the target was engaged and it was a successful mission. In addition, 30 Ukrainian unmanned aerial vehicles were shot down um, across the areas of the Lugansk People's Republic, Donetsk People's Republic, the Zaporozhye region and the Kherson region today. These uh, unmanned aerial vehicles are larger drones, not the smaller FPV ones we were talking about earlier. And over the Black Sea, reports that a Russian Su-30 fighter jet prevented a US Air Force MQ-9 Reaper reconnaissance drone from violating Russia's state border over the Black Sea. Now, there are frequent reports of um, American drones operating over the Black Sea, um, providing reconnaissance and gathering information for the Ukrainian forces. We saw that when the uh, Russian uh, military boat a month ago and the SIG uh, oil freighter were attacked, that there were reports at that time um, of operations in the Black Sea. in this southern area here of the Black Sea of um, Reaper drones operating in this area here. Now, just wanting to just recap a little bit on some um, reporting today on deliveries of Western weapons to the armed forces of Ukraine in August, which this just gives a, a summary of what has been provided in, in, in the month of August so far. August the 13th, 2023, Germany delivered 10 BV-206 all-terrain vehicles, two Patriot launchers. So these are the American-made Patriot launcher systems. Again, items that were um, touted as being a game changer when they arrived in the conflict, but ones which we again saw... Um, a uh, video of one early on in the Kiev region um, being struck by a Russian, what I believe was a hypersonic missile. So the Germans provided two more of these Patriot launcher systems. 6,525, 155 millimeter rounds. Now, the German numbers of 155 millimeter rounds that they have provided over the last two months have been dwindling smaller and smaller. Here, we see a, uh, an increase to 6,000 rounds. Now note that the Ukrainians are going through six or 7,000 rounds per day. So this equates to one day of ammunition. 
However, these 155 millimetre rounds are reportedly for setting smoke screens. So these aren't um, explosive rounds. These aren't even the cluster munitions which the Americans have been providing, but they are for smoke screens. Five armoured vehicles for the border service. Four reconnaissance drones. The type of drone is not specified here. 14 trailers of various payloads as part of the planned deliveries. Um, Biden has asked Congress for $9.5 billion in additional emergency funding for the US aid initiative program and $3.6 billion from another fund. Germany delivered only 10 of the Leopard 1 tanks out of the promised 110. Um, there was information about the acquisition by an unknown buyer, which is probably Rheinmetall, of 49 Leopard 1 tanks from Belgium. These were reportedly from a Belgian um, uh, arms dealer, I believe, ultimately was the, the role that this man was playing. And he had, yet yeah, there's 49 of these Leopard 1s which were purchased for restoration and transferred to the armed forces of Ukraine. Um, reportedly, this is to happen over a six-month period. On August the 19th, 2023, Germany delivered two launches for IRIST SLS, 4,559 155mm rounds. <clears throat> Again, this is less or just perhaps half of what the Ukrainians use in a day. So this is sort of you know, 12 hours of, of, of ammunition. Uh, again, uh, for setting smoke screens and not high explosive 155mm rounds. 10 short-range mobile radars. Now, these radars are quite possibly used for short-range um, short missile defence, um, perhaps used on the front line for close-operating aircraft or may be used in um, more urban areas for defence of incoming missiles. 16 trailers of various capacities as part of the planned deliveries. Um, the United States allocated... Weapons for $200 million of value. Missiles for the Patriot, um, estimated to be 16 pieces. Missiles for HIMARS, estimated to be 100 pieces. 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter artillery rounds. 5,000 of each. Now the 155 millimeter rounds, the 5,000, again, that's less than a day's quota. Um, so combined, what we've seen thus far up until August the 19th in August is that Ukraine has received an extra three quarters of a day of ammunition supplies in terms of 155 millimeter shells from the Americans and a day and a half of smokescreen shells from the Germans. 120 millimeter tank shells, approximately 1,000. Tow anti-tank missiles, 50. Javelin anti-tank missiles, 50. And RPG missiles, 100 estimated. 37 vehicles and 58 tank trucks. Sweden announced the 13th military assistance package of $313 million in parts and ammunition. 100 million of this for the Triple K CV-90 uh, and Leopard 2 parts. 195 million for vehicles, mine clearance equipment and ammunition, and about 18 million for AMRAM missiles for NASAMs, about 15 pieces provided there. Denmark is considering allocating $2.6 billion for military assistance to the armed forces of Ukraine in 2023 and 2024. Then, the update from just last week, August the 26th, Germany, as part of the planned deliveries, delivered missiles for the Patriot system. A total of 64 units were promised, uh, 40 reconnaissance drones and 16 trailers. Croatia announced the allocation of 33 million for military assistance to the armed forces of Ukraine. Denmark has announced the transfer of six F-16s in 2023, eight in 2024 and five more in subsequent years. This is interesting, and this is a topic of conversation in many social media channels, is that um, will the F-16s ever get to Ukraine? 
um, Denmark announcing that six will arrive in 2023. Now, that may well mean that they have six available and ready. However, they still need to pair them up with Ukrainian pilots who are capable of flying them. Um, reports are that this is a problem uh, with um, two of the top Ukrainian pilots killed two days ago in a collision. Uh, reports today that two more Ukrainian jets were taken out. Um, so this is reducing the number of pilots they have capable of flying the F-16s. Generally, these would only be given to their top pilots. You imagine their top pilots would be the men working in the war at the moment. Um, also, there appear to be challenges in that the Americans and the um, the, the Danes don't have, um, on the, in the Nordic countries, don't have Ukrainian-speaking F-16 pilots and instructors, and so the Ukrainian pilots are having to lift their English skills to a level where they can um, suitably learn. At least this is the run of the reports being given for the delays in the F-16s being available. So while there are reports from Denmark that they will have six F-16s available to Ukraine in 2023, if the Ukrainians will have pilots capable of flying them at that stage is yet to be seen. Um, Norway announced its readiness to transfer the F-16 to Ukraine, but has found it difficult to name the number that it will provide. And as I've, I've mentioned in the past, the the Americans are not particularly keen on seeing the F-16s in the conflict. I think that they realise that they won't be a game changer, uh, that they will be attrited rather rapidly, particularly if they arrive in small numbers like this, six of them at a time. There are problems or challenges being faced by the Ukrainians in providing the infrastructure and the runways required by F-16s. F-16s have an air scoop underneath them, very low to the ground. They need very clean runways of particular lengths, minimum lengths, debris, badly constructed um, runways which might uh, kick up stones and things like that. They won't operate on them because they will be ingested into the engine and will destroy the engine. And then you have years or months, if not years of time, trying to repair or replace those um, heavily maintenance-intensive pieces of equipment. Months, not years. Um, so yes, the, the, the F-16s getting into Ukraine will be problematic. They won't be a game changer. The Americans don't really want to see them there. Um, they recognise that once they do enter the conflict, that it will be major international news on the first day that an F-16 is shot down. They will become the prime target for Russian air defence systems. Um, we have already been told that um, certain Western equipment is given a, a bonus to Russian uh, forces who are able to take out things like Leopards and Strikers and Challengers uh, and M777s. Uh, and the Polish crabs and those type of things are given bonuses over destroying, say, Soviet-era tanks and artillery. No doubt a similar thing will happen for the F-16s, making them a prime target. Uh, and, yeah, as I've said, many people questioning whether they will actually get into the fight in time to actually assist Ukraine. Um just a little bit now, I just want to talk a little bit about Germany, as Germany was so prominent in August in terms of providing support. Um, Germany is having problems. Uh, the political tide is changing in Germany. Olaf Schultz, the current Chancellor, has just seen in a survey, a poll conducted last week, um, his lowest polling ever since he assumed the role of the um, Chancellor and the head of the Social Democratic Party's role in 2021, his polling has fallen to 31%. Now, this is the same at the same time as the uh, AfD, the alternative for Deutschland, has hit an all-time high of 22% approval rating last month. Um Problems are coming from their green policies. Now, Schultz, um, Schultz operates a coalition, 
and a coalition is between Schultz's Social Democratic Party, the SPD, uh, the Greens and the FDP, which is the Free Democratic Party. Now, the green, uh, the Germans have moved to a very green stance, um, particularly since the um, Fukushima, Fukushima nuclear dis- uh, disaster with the earthquake in 2011. After that, that triggered debate in the German parliament and a decision was made that they would denuclearize their power system. Um, many people, myself included, question the logic of this. But anyhow, that's a decision that they have made, um, but this is causing problems for Germany in a number of reg- reasons or areas. Um, Schultz has uh, yesterday announced that Germany is now going to turn towards deep geothermal energy as a as a power source this is um the utilization of thermal the thermal properties uh under the earth's crust at a depth below 400 meters so at that depth in certain areas you have geothermal activity which causes intense heat um you can then pump water down to those depths and it will immediately be heated for you so you get the heat transference of energy you get steam coming out the other end at the top and you can turn a turbine now this is not as simple a solution as it sounds it does provide more um, more consistent energy than say wind or solar solar of course you've got nighttime every day wind the wind doesn't blow all the time uh, with your geothermal yep you have that uh, consistently However, some of the challenges around this are it is very location dependent. You can't choose where you have your um, geothermal power plants. It's chosen for you. It depends on where the geothermal um, areas are. So you need to work around that. Um, Can also cause localized earthquakes, I've read. Um, Again, this is due to the nature of pumping water down to get the heat transference occurring and that this can destabilize um, the substructure of the earth there, which can lead to earthquakes. So, yeah, Germany's, um, I would call them far green, you have far left and far right. Germany's government has gone far green. Um, They turn their backs on nuclear generation and the 15th of April saw the last German nuclear power plant shut down. This is in contrast to an announcement today uh, that Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, have just done a deal with China where where they will see China develop a nuclear power plant for them. Now, um, a lot of people obviously have concerns about nuclear power um, because of Chernobyl. Um, Fukushima, yeah, a different a different type of uh, disaster there by you know, caused by one of the most disastrous one of the most disastrous earthquakes we've seen in the last probably thirty or forty years, I suppose. Um, however, nuclear generation, nuclear technology has come a long way since Chernobyl. Um, nuclear power plants are developed now in sort of fail safe modes, so that Things like you know, cooling, cooling systems or cooling um, p- ponds and what have you are uh, developed such that if power goes out, there's a failure in power and to these containment systems, then they fail safe. So they will fail and dump their cooling fluid over the rods and that type of thing. So uh, nuclear, nuclear energy is a power source which we really should be looking at. We should be investing in heavily. Um, Australia is a nation with great uranium reserves who really should be taking the opportunity to advance by using that power that it has available to it. Now, Germany is the same. Um, again, this is interesting You know that Germany has taken this approach and then we look at France. Now, France is looking like getting closer and closer to kicking off some direct military operation in Niger. And that is primarily because Niger has cut off the supply of uranium to France. So different different nations, France understanding the need for nuclear energy. Germany has gone 
completely green and decided they don't need it, um, which is a problem for them because they've also lost, due to the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, access to Russian um, gas. And because of sanctions, which they've agreed to, they've lost the ability to purchase Russian oil at cheap prices. Um, he's actually... Um, Chancellor Schultz is getting some heat from a number of areas. Now, um, the Prime Minister of the German Federal State of Saxony, Michael Kretschmer, um, he's talking about the Nord Stream pipeline and saying, the repair of Nord Stream 1 is a um, manifestation of common sense. This is necessary because the infrastructure can secure our energy supply in five or ten years. Um, according to Kretz, uh, Kretschmer, if the pipeline is not repaired soon, the pipeline will be permanently destroyed by corrosion. And he goes on to say something very interesting. It's in international waters and off the coast of Denmark, so you can get to it. He also says it also has nothing to do with the military conflict because the cause of the destruction was a terrorist attack. And after all, it would be the most normal thing in the world to repair a pipeline. So interesting here that this is the Prime Minister of the German federal state of Saxony. And he, I think, is using the Western narrative against the German government here in saying that uh, the Nord Stream pipe destruction has nothing to do with the military conflict um, because the cause of the destruction was a terrorist attack which is, I think, the public word in the West. So here he's using that against the German Chancellor by saying, well, there's nothing, yeah, there's no reason why you can't fix this and get this operating again. It's got nothing to do with Russia or Ukraine. It was a terrorist attack. Um, so that's, that's interesting to see what will happen there. Now, the next federal election is due in late 2025, before, it's got to be before October 2025 in Germany. Um... And that will be an interesting um, election. The uh, the AfD, the alternative for Deutschland, a party which I said is growing, they're, they're considered or they're, they're painted as being far right. They're not really far right. I've in a previous, uh, in a previous video, I've gone through and described a little bit of their thinking. Um, they seem to be more just you know, conservative, central, centrist conservatives to me in general. Um, but they will be a challenge at this election. If their support continues to grow across 2023, 2024 and into 2025 and they continue their upward trend, then they will be causing challenges for the um, the, the uh, opposition leader who is uh, Friedrich Merz. He's the leader of the CDU, um, which is the Christian Democrats, and he has said in the past that he would not work with the AFD. He had previously got himself into trouble because, again, Germany is very um, is very conscious of anything which appears to be far right or Nazi, and he was talking about working with the AFD in some local area elections and that blew back on him. So he's now stepping away from that and suggesting that he would not work with the AFD and there would be other majorities that could be found um, going into an, an, an election in 2025. However, as I say, if the AFD continue to rise in popularity, um, uh, Friedrich Merz may be, may be finding that he needs to consider, if he wishes to actually be Chancellor, that he needs to consider working with the AFD. All right, that's enough for tonight. Hey, if you've watched this far, thank you very much. Um, if, you haven't been, if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.